Good morning, church. What a beautiful and glorious day to worship our loving God. You know what the psalmist says in uh, chapter 31? He says, Lord, how wonderful you are. You have stored up so many good things for us, Amen. like a treasure chest heaped up and spilling up with blessing, and all yeah. for those who honor and worship you. Yeah. Amen. And that's our God. God wants to overwhelm us with his outrageous, unexpected, lavish, and undeserved goodness. Amen. 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 And why would he do that? Because we are the object of his affection. Yeah. Amen. And it comes very naturally to him. So no matter what your hang-ups or your baggage has been of the, of the, of the week, God wants to pour out his goodness upon us. Amen. I call it happy state. God wants to pour out his happy state over each one of us. Amen. Not because we deserve it, but because there is something about who he is that he pours or overflows us in extravagant ways over us. Amen. So let's rise up and worship this amazing God and give us, give him our best. Yeah. Amen. Let's sing of his goodness. Yeah. Yeah. He's good. Yeah. Let me hear that in the house. God is good.
running out for us. His goodness keeps running out for us.
Amen. Isn't God good? You want to just tell somebody that my God is a good God and He's good to me. Amen. Come on, say to somebody. Amen. This morning as we met for prayer, it was, it was an amazing time of prayer. There's so many there, you know, God in our midst. Pastor Basil brought uh, something from Psalm 46. And as he shared that, you know, I was just thinking and thinking and just visualizing various images. And he said, you know, when all structure shakes, when all the structures shake, uh, you know, God is there. He is ever present. He is continuously there. Amen. He's a good God. And then, you know what he shared? He shared that there is a stream that makes him glad. Yeah. And he said to us, ask God to let that stream come and get you. Amen. This morning, we want to ask the stream of the goodness of God to come and get us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we want to ask God the stream that just brings us joy to come and get us. Amen. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. So just once more, you know, maybe you want to just join with me as I lift my hands here. And you just say, you know, God, thank you for your goodness. I just bless you for your goodness. Come people, lift those voice and say, I thank you for your goodness. I bless you for your goodness. You are amazing in your goodness. You promise that it'll never cease. It'll keep chasing me, chasing me, chasing me, chasing me. It will never run out of steam. Oh God, we just bless you this morning. We just bless you this morning. Lord, we see scripture. When people ran away from you, your goodness chased after them. When people didn't know what to do, you were a good God. When man's back was kicked, uh, was continuously turned against you and they were kicking against you, you were so good, you sent your son for us. We want to thank you for that this morning. And we say, Lord, we bless you. We just bless you. We just bless you. People, once, once again, I just feel in my heart, let's give an applause to God this morning. He is so good. He is so good. He is so good. You know, He is just good. And I will always be good. Amen. Father, we cheerfully bring our offering as we worship. We declare that we live in the year of your favor. We confess that your grace to give sacrificially towards all your kingdom purposes rests on us. We receive the promise of your pouring a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over in our lives. We declare all our needs are met according to the riches of God's glory in Christ Jesus. We declare that we flourish in the time of famine and chaos. We declare miraculous and extravagant provision will be our portion and through us, many will be blessed. We declare that new doors of serving and sharing resources are opening for us to be a blessing in the city. This is going to be our biggest and best year yet. In Jesus' name, Amen. A mom uh, texts and says, Hi, son. Uh, what does IDK, LY, and TTYL mean? He texts back and says, I don't know. Love you. Talk to you later. <laughs> the mom texts back and says, It's okay. Don't worry. I'll ask your sister. Love you too. <laughs> You know, uh, 
we came back from the from the US Saturday before last and uh, we couldn't find our baggage in the in the baggage area and so we went to the luggage office and uh, and, and and told the woman there that our bags hadn't arrived it wasn't on the uh, carousel and uh, she kind of looked back and, to, and smiled and said, hey, don't worry, uh, you know, we are trained people, we are all professionals, just don't worry at all. And so, uh, w- you know, we looked at her and then her next thing to us was, uh, has your fright arrived? <laughs> all right, that's just a joke, all right, okay. Uh, listen, when you look at Genesis uh, chapter three and the blessing of the Lord, you begin to understand that we were designed for increase. Yeah. All right, so expect it. Yeah. All right, expect it. You know, a lot of stuff is happening around, and God wants to step in on our behalf, and he wants to turn up with signs and wonders and, and miracles. There is something that people can argue about. They can argue about theology, your interpretation of Scripture, your perspective, etc. They can't argue about your testimony. That's right. yes. yeah. All right, and when God steps in with his power then people just completely turn around. Amen? And so, uh, just to say to you that whenever you share testimony, it just creates an environment for people to believe. All right, like Alvin prayed today, all right, I believe in miracles because I believe in Jesus Christ. The minute a miracle happens, people turn to the person who's actually performed the miracle. All right? And so uh, this testimony, as we've heard often, is a prophecy of what's going to happen. So when you're hearing somebody's testimony, grab onto it and say, Jesus, that's for me. Because that testimony becomes something that prophesies what is going to happen when I'm concerned. All right? Now you may say, hey, uh, where did you get that from? You know, I've been focusing a lot on the Gospels, especially these last two months. And one of the things I've seen over and over again is that Jesus did certain things so that the prophetic words of the Old Testament would be fulfilled. Yeah. All right? Very fascinating. All right? He did this because it, it, it says, uh, and he went down, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Egypt so that the prophetic word would be fulfilled that out of Egypt have I called my son. All right. He goes, and in a dream he's warned, he goes to Nazareth, and the scripture says, so that it'll be, uh, the prophetic word will be fulfilled, that out of Nazareth, that he will be called a Nazarene. All right. Very fascinating. And so there are a lot of obstacles from where I am to where actually I am going. A lot of obstacles. And uh, that prophetic word actually brings my, brings a breakthrough where I'm concerned. That prophetic word is, as I've said to you again and again, God goes into my future, brings to me a word in my present to help me overcome those kind of obstacles. All right? You want to often move from the prison to the palace, there's always going to be a process. All right? And many times when a prophetic word comes to you, it's coming to you and it's bringing to you outcome. It's not telling you about process and journey. That's left for you and I to work out. All right? I have great news for you this morning, and that is God is enlarging our capacity, all right, so that we would be able to get even deeper into his purposes. Amen? And uh, there are going to be a lot of testimonies. You know, the testimony is just speaking about the grace of God, His grace upon my story. Amen? I felt also this one-liner for some of us this morning that the Lord is ripping out the root of disappointment that is affecting the seed of faith. I'll say that one more time for you. The Lord is ripping out that root of disappointment which is affecting the seed of faith. Yeah, amen. All right? There are a lot of things that have happened, especially in the last couple of years, that have brought us into a place of disappointment. And the Lord wants to change that. All right? We often carry disappointment because we have lost hope. Remember that any thought that we have that does not carry hope is under a lie. Any thought. So if it doesn't carry hope, it's under a lie. And that's where we need Jesus to step in. And that's where the truth comes to set us free. Remember, lies are only as powerful 
when I believe them. All right? Otherwise, they don't have power. Amen? And so this morning, uh, I, I want to continue going through the book of Acts, all right? Uh, you know, more than the Acts of the Apostles, this is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And uh, we are, we finished chapter 14 uh, last week as Carol brought to us uh, uh, a, a study. We looked at call to purpose, all right? She talked about three points, call and equip, that God equips us supernaturally with authority and power so that our calling, we'll be able to develop it and we'll be able to develop it effectively, all right? The second thing was that uh, he has not only called and equipped us, but he's called us to equip others. And so it's really key and important that we are being discipled, but also discipling others. And then we are called to persevere, all right, and press in into presence, press in into intimacy, so that it's at that place where we begin to feel his heartbeat. Break my heart with what breaks yours. Amen? And so, uh, hey, through this series, we want to be teaching, not so much preaching, yeah? So we want to just kind of bring to you what's actually happening there and what God did through the early church and through people. And I love the scripture because it tells you of all the good things and the not so good things. All right, of all the struggle and the conflict and the stuff that people went through. And yet you begin to see the kingdom of God advancing and growing. All right. And so after the stoning of Stephen... Uh, in Acts chapter 7, uh, great persecution broke out. And the, the, the believers began to be scattered. And we know from Acts chapter 11 that a lot of them went up to Antioch. So Jerusalem's here, Antioch is there. They went up there and they began to speak to the Jews about Jesus. And a time came when they then moved from speaking to the Jews to the Gentiles. All right, to the Greek kind of people. And... Uh, a lot of early church converts, when you look at it, came from Antioch and came from the Gentiles, not the Jews. This cosmopolitan kind of city, and I'll come to that in a second, all right, uh, broke down the barriers of race and religion. All right? Just when you enter a train and you're going about, you don't think what caste the person is, what religion they are. Everybody just wants to get under the train, yeah? All right? So, so you began to see that, that actually this broke down and, and, and because uh, it was less, considerably less religious than Palestine, all right, you begin to see the church really growing rapidly. All right? And that has great significance and hope for us as a city here in Mumbai. Somebody said amen. amen. Thank you. All right? And so... Uh, when the news of the success of the gospel kind of reaching out to people uh, reached the years of the apostles in Jerusalem, they actually sent Barnabas to check it out, all right? So it's a kind of 300-mile journey. That's, that's, that's quite a distance, actually. And uh, Barnabas goes there. The scripture tells us that he was glad when he saw the evidence of God, the grace of God, all right? And uh, he was a man of faith and, uh, and of wisdom. And, uh, you know, great many people then come, came to the Lord. Uh, and then he goes off and he finds Paul and brings him back. And he, and he says, hey, you know, actually what we need, we need leadership in this place. Leadership is so important for the growth and development of the church. And uh, they begin to work in that place uh, for, for some time. And as they worked in that place, all right, people of uh, standing and influence and of, uh, of, of considerable uh, resources at their hands came to know Jesus, which resulted in them being able to finance the poorer saints in Jerusalem through the time of famine. Wasn't it amazing? All right. And uh, uh, we also see that all three of Paul's missionary journeys are launched from Antioch. All right. So as we came to the end of chapter 14 last week, right at the end, they, it says that he's already gone on this first journey. He's come back. And now he's actually giving a report of what has actually happened. And it's so very important that there is this accountability factor in us, especially as leaders, that we are able to come and say, hey, we were sent out and this is now what has happened. So talking about Antioch, just a little background to that. It was a third most important Roman, uh, uh, important city in the Roman Empire in the first century, 
all right and uh, it reported about 500,000 people that's a lot of people for the for uh, a small population of the first century it stood only behind Rome and Alexandria in Egypt and this was a place which was a crossroads for a lot of business connections right through the Roman Empire and uh, a large Jewish community helped greatly in the development of Christianity here in Antioch all right there's a historian uh, Metzger who actually says that one-seventh of the population bowed the knee to Jesus Amen. all right one-seventh all right. that's really very really fascinating when you look at it and it's hard to imagine that the Syria of old which is now actually uh, uh, modern it's, it's modern day Turkish uh, Antakya all right so it's no longer in Syria, it's, it's actually in Turkey at the moment. It was once the cradle of the Church of Jesus Christ. All right. It's hard to imagine when you, when you look at what's happening in that part of the world. All right. And so you also know that it was in Antioch where the believers were first given the name that we are known by nowadays, and that's Christians. All right. So this was a word that was coined and just flung at the believers. All right. Uh, what was in the mind of the users when they actually use that word for Christians. So um, just of note is that a Caesar, a Caesarian with an OS at the end, OS, all right, was an imperial slave or a soldier that belonged to Caesar, all right? The comparable or comparable Greek form Christian, Christianos, all right, implies a servant or a slave belonging to Christ all right that's what they recognized that's what they saw and that's why they call them Christians yeah all right and so I'm, I'm picking up in, in verse 1 I hope you have your Bibles with you or your devices with some scripture hey I still believe in paper <laughs> all right maybe old school but really good to actually look at a scripture mark it out study it look back at it really really good all right, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, ouch, all right, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. All right, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. And the church sent them on their way. And as they traveled to Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how Gentiles had been converted and the news made all the believers glad. All right, so it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating what's happened. They have this dispute. All right, they're traveling back, but they are taking every opportunity to actually tell people about Gentiles who have come to Jesus. So, you see, once the Gentiles had been evangelized, the problem of circumcision and the conditions of church membership or membership of the church began to arise. All right, and the policy of the church in Antioch was that you were not required to keep the Jewish law. All right. And so uh, you begin to see that in chapter, chapters 11, 12, 13, 14, all right? But it's a little silent. However, it's really clear from chapter 15 and verse 1. And so what happened then was that this policy was unacceptable to some Jewish Christians for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they found it really, really difficult, all right, to believe in general. How can somebody be saved without accepting the obligation of Jewish law. How is that possible? All right. And secondly, how can I actually have fellowship at the table of a Gentile because I don't really know what kind of food he's serving me? All right. And that had a big implication, especially on the breaking of bread. All right. Unlike today, where we have the breaking of bread and it's just bread, the elements of, of bread and wine, all right, which is broken together. In, in, in the early church, the breaking of bread all right, was actually right at the center of a huge meal that everybody participated. All right. And that's why we encourage you at small groups, especially when we have potluck, hey, let's break bread together all right, and enjoy our meal together. That's what the, that's what the early church actually did and so uh, uh, the issue that is actually happening here 
all right, in this whole kind of tussle between uh, legalistic Jews and Gentiles who are coming to the Lord and must, all right, is, 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 is mentioned here. But it's actually, if you look at the timeline, it's a similar time when Paul wrote to the Galatians. All right. And uh, uh, you begin to see that Galatians is a grace gospel bringing heaven's freedom into our lives. That's what Paul talks when, he, when he's writing to uh, the Galatians. All right. And uh, he's talking about his freedom and he's talking about a freedom to live our lives, a freedom to serve one another and a freedom from religious bondage. And Paul writes to the Galatians because... This freedom is actually under attack. What about us today? What about us today? What about the fact that when we come to know Jesus, all right, we are super excited. And as we go on in our Christian life, we get so bogged down with rules and regulations. And we're trying to follow certain kind of things. I have heard so many things when it comes to uh, uh, Christian, our, our Christian walk, all right, and uh, you begin to actually look at the scripture and you begin to understand, hey, where did this come from? Where did this come from? All right. For example, you cannot partake of bread unless you've been water baptized. All right. We have got these kind of rules and regulations. And we say that, hey, this is something that you have to do first, second, third, and this is how you have to follow things if you have to be part of a church. When you look at a scripture, you really don't see so many of these things. And it's a life of freedom. Yeah. But remember that this grace that is ours in abundance with freedom is not to be abused. All right, what then shall we keep on sinning? That the grace of God shall abound, Romans chapter 6. He says, no. So there's this whole kind of balance, but an understanding that this is all about Jesus. You see, I want, my identity often comes from what I do. All right, we go into fasting and prayer, all right, because we think that because I prayed and because I fasted, Jesus, you need to actually answer my prayer. So what actually happens is, I actually then go into a place of disappointment because my prayer is not answered, all right, and actually, Think with me for a moment, what we are doing is taking the place of God. <laughs> God is God and I'm not. And I can't be telling him what he should be doing and what he should not be doing. All right. Prayer and fast, hey, is really important as Benny was saying. You know, it was super exciting to see uh, 20 people uh, this morning just calling upon the name of the Lord for almost an hour. Really, really good. And we want to pray. And uh, you know that as a church, we go through times of fasting. In fact, we are coming soon up to our 40 days of prayer and fast. All right? So we do that and because we firmly believe that this is a, But to actually use that to twist the arm of God and to say, hey, you need to do it because I'm doing this, that is not the gospel of grace. All right? And so um, let, me, let me encourage you. I don't have time this morning, but let me encourage you. Look at some of the... Uh, things that Paul has written in the book of Galatians. All right. Uh, you know. People were sent to spy out on the wonderful liberty and freedom that we have in Jesus, the anointed one. Their agenda was to bring us back into legalistic bondage of religion. This is relationship with Jesus, not religion. But you must know that we did not want to submit to their religious shackles. All right. <laughs> the, 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 the chaining down of somebody, not even for a moment, so that we might keep the gospel of grace unadulterated for you. All right? And so uh, Paul continues to actually write, and, and he then talks about what happened to Peter. All right? Peter was associating himself, and I'm, I'm saying this because we're going to come into what uh, James actually gives us instruction. But Peter was associating himself with all the Gentiles in Antioch, having a great time, feasting at their tables. And the minute some people came down from James, who was a considerable figure of influence, all right, and very, very Jewish, I might add, he changed himself. And so, so it says there, 
When he saw this, he withdrew himself from his non-Jewish friends and separated himself, acting like an Orthodox Jew, fearing how it would look to them if he ate with the non-Jewish believers. How many of us this morning are bothered about how it looks to people? I want to suggest to you, ask yourself, how does this look to God? How does this look to God? And so because of Peter's hypocrisy, many other Jewish believers follow suit, refusing to eat with the non-Jewish believers. Even Barnabas, this amazing man of, of, of encouragement, was led astray by their poor example and condoned this legalistic, hypocritical behavior. And so when I realized that they were acting inconsistently with the revelation of grace, I confronted Peter in front of everyone. All right? Okay, so thank, you know, we want to say, Jesus, thank you that you have shown us uh, from the scripture and you've brought to us this understanding. In fact, uh, uh, right at the end of this chapter, which I'm not going to go into this morning, all right, uh, Paul and Barnabas have such a sharp dispute about John Mark that they part ways, all right? But the scripture says that the people in Antioch gathered together and they send them off. They bless them. All right, and so for us to understand that on times there is going to be a different perspective, we are going to see things differently, and we need to embrace that. All right, and for us to understand that there is a difference between principles and methodology. All right, and so when you look at metho methodology, and if you can visualize in your mind something between black and, gr and, and, and white. All right, and in between there are a hundred shades of gray, and every one is absolutely correct. It's gray. Tracking? All right. So there are so many different ways of doing things, and that's the freedom that we want to actually walk in, where we are not saying, "Hey, there's only one way to do something." Now, often as as leadership teams in churches. You, you kind of come together, you seek Holy Spirit, and then for a season, you walk down a certain way. All right? So there's this whole kind of balance as you kind of go along. So coming back to chapter 15 and verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. All right? And so you begin to understand that at this stage of church history, it is Antioch that is the model for us, not Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem. And you see the Christians in Jerusalem becoming increasingly conservative. All right? The, the conversion of the Gentiles had been gaining momentum. In fact, when you look at Stephen in chapter 7, he envisioned a, a faith Without the preoccupation of the temple. You remember? He says, heaven is God's throne and earth is his footstool. How can this temple contain him? And then you see the, uh, the, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And then obviously uh, Cornelius and his, and his whole kind of household. All right, And you see what is actually happening with the Gentiles, all right? I, I must say to you that, you see, we, from time to time, we, we get sucked in. Because when you read what Paul is writing about Peter in Galatians chapter 2, all right, Acts chapter 10 has already happened. You're tracking? And praise God that Peter comes to his senses and so does Barnabas. But they needed somebody like Paul to point it out. And praise God for the humility of these men who were uh, apostles. And that's something key and important that we position and posture our heart to be able to receive from everyone. Especially 
from people who are walking in an authority that God has, has, has rested upon their shoulders, that we are willing to consider our position because of what they are bringing to us, because that will save us. So here comes a great challenge to Jewish uh, Christians in uh, Jerusalem. For centuries, they had followed this kind of understanding that you needed to be circumcised. All right? Circumcision was a token. It was a reminder that you were actually a covenant people of God. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. No wonder they had a big problem, actually. In fact, when you read Genesis chapter 17 and verse 14, it says there, Abraham was, ta- was told that anyone not circumcised should be cut off from the seed of Abraham. It was that serious. And then we all know the story in, in, in Exodus chapter 4 that Moses almost loses his life because he fails to circumcise his sons who were Grown men at that time. They were not small little boys. All right? You remember that? And so, surely, it was not possible for you to be part of the people of God without being circumcised. God's people were always this kind of nation. Circumcision was a sign of them being engrafted into God's holy nation and therefore it was really, really necessary. Jerusalem was the holy city. Hebrew was the holy language. How can Gentiles be saved without adopting the holy land and the holy sign of membership that was circumcision? How is it possible? When the persecution happened, and as you come into AD 40, a lot of the apostles have also left uh, Jerusalem. All right? James has actually left back. He's actually leading the church. And the Jews in, in Jerusalem tolerated the Christians all right, uh, to the extent, as long as they were not pro-Gentile. All right? They didn't mind it, actually. And so you see some Christians in Jerusalem seeming to agree with the enemies of Paul, and of grace. Question for us this morning as covenant blessings. Are we progressive Antioch or conservative Jerusalem? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Are we people who just get stuck into a form of worship, into a form of the way we do things? Or are we open to actually seeing things change. Truth and revelation are progressively unfolding. And that's something that you want to be at a place where you are actually embracing what God is doing. Because when the cloud moves and I don't, I'm just left behind. You ever wonder why there are so many factions and so many splits in churches? One of the main reasons is this is that God moved. The experts of yesterday become the enemies of today. And the experts of today become the enemy of tomorrow. All right. The greatest opposition to the new wave coming in is the old wave going out. All right. We who live by the sea have seen that over and over again. And so that's what we want to cast that wave and ride on it. <clears throat> Verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this, this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you. The Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart showed them that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. So we know that the Jews had a Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The Gentiles had a Pentecost in Acts chapter 10. He did not discriminate between us and them for He purified their hearts by faith. And so nothing separates us as Jews and Gentiles. For when we believe, our hearts are made pure. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke? All right. uh, 
No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. And so, it's clearly indicating that the Gentiles, believers, do not need to be circumcised. And that our hearts are purified by faith. And so, here you see again Peter taking the lead. All right? So, he's quiet for a little while, and then again, he's taking a lead. And, and, and this is a paradigm shift in both thought resulting in belief. So my thinking is actually moving and I'm coming to this place that I am now actually believing. Listen to me, it's not what I say, it's what I believe, yeah? yeah. Many times I say God is good. Do I really believe it? And in a good penny charismatic churches, if, you, if the worship leader says God is good, you'll say all the time. Yeah. But is that something that I really, really, really believe? When I go through difficulties of situations, when as we heard this morning from Psalm 46, though the mountains quake and fall into the sea, when everything around me is crumbling, do I still believe he's good? Yes. And so Peter actually sees the change that is coming before others. And, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, uh, delivery coupled with his credibility actually keeps the church moving forward. All right, and then the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and then Paul telling about the signs and wonders that has happened among the Gentiles. See, many, many people say, hey, listen, it's only theology. It is not experience. All right? And many people say, if you base your theology on experience, you're on thin ice. Let me just suggest to you this morning that my experience actually takes me back to actually ask myself, is my theology correct? And here is the experience that Peter and Paul and Barnabas are presenting to the council. And see what James actually then says. When they finished, James spoke up and said, Brothers, listen to me. Verse 14. Simon. All right. He's not calling him Peter. He's gone back to his name. All right. For the sake of the Jews. Simon has described uh, to us how God first intervened and chose a people for his name among the Gentiles. All right. And the words of the prophets, plural, are in agreement with this as it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. His ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things from long ago. And so you see that this understanding of what the prophets and it's so very important that we are reading the scripture so that when we go through things that we experience which are new our minds and our hearts the spirit can remind us of what is actually said in the old testament and although the quotation seems to be from amos all right uh, it's, it's 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 james all right adding to Amos because when you read the words you will see something of Jeremiah something of Hosea something of Isaiah all in this, this scripture and therefore he says the prophets all right the prophets of old has said this all right and so um, because of this there's a document that is produced and this document results in actually liberating Christians everywhere from the burden and guilt of the Jewish law. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah? Everybody's tracking with me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of go through what things are here. Now, now, just to say to you, clashes of culture cause great confusion and difficulty. All right. Okay. So, we have uh, somebody in interior Maharashtra uh, breaking a bread time, they break the coconut. And I know we sat as pastors and, and, and there, was a, there was a lot of debate about this. All right. There's a lot of debate about this. I just asked myself a question. If Jesus actually ministered in Maharashtra, would he actually break bread and use wine? I don't know. <laughs> You're talking with me? So these are kind of elements that are talking to us 
about a sacrifice. See, these elements need to point us to Jesus, not take us away from him. And, and an argument starts. And, 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 and the guy actually visually takes this coconut, all right, and he breaks it on the ground, all right, and the ground doesn't break, yeah, like we saw. Anyhow, he breaks it on the ground, and as he does that, the water just kind of spills out, and he then dramatically says that this is what happened on the cross at Calvary. What a visual. There's so much of debate. Now you may say that's wrong. Maybe. It could be right. Maybe. But I'm not here to discuss that. I'm here to actually understand our people coming to know Jesus. All right? So, I think clear and careful discussion is, is actually needed. And, and also for us to define what does this mean. Because if you have to say to me the law, my mind tells me immediately it's the Mosaic law. But for some, the law could be principles of righteousness. For others, when you talk about a law, they are thinking the royal law, as James says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. So it's very important that we are defining what do you actually mean. And, and Paul was eager, number three, that theories should not override facts. Because we all have these theories. All right. I remember somebody from our church coming to me and telling me that uh, Rick Warren's of the devil. You know. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's blasphemous and things like that, etc., etc., all that. And he said, I, I just asked him a question. I said, have you met Rick Warren? And he said, no. And I said to him, uh, we have met him three times. Three times we've been at the conferences. I'll never forget Kathy meeting him. She had just bit into the apple and he came and shook her hand. And that just, it was hilarious, actually. She didn't know whether to spit it out or what to do. You know, as she's trying to finish it quickly as she's shaking his hand. I mean, what an amazing guy, actually. All right. You don't know the guy. I said, how do you know? He says, some lady in Australia says that this is a... I said, do you know the lady? He says, no. <laughs> so, it's really important that theories do not override facts. And we are beginning to understand and, and actually see what are the facts, you know. All right. Really, really important. Paul was justified... Uh, sorry, Abraham was justified before the law existed. Yes or no? That's what the scripture tells us. I myself received salvation and was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues before I was water baptized. All right? So you come try telling me that actually I only come into salvation when I'm water baptized. And try telling Cornelius' family in Acts chapter 10 that. All right? Is water baptism important? It is really, really important. But you can't say it goes this one, two, three, four. All right. Amen. I want to encourage you to study scripture. When you study scripture, practice it. Put it into practice. Because otherwise knowledge just pops up. Again, a lot of knowledge. I need to actually understand at the end of the day, God, what do you want me to do with what I've studied? How do I actually put this into practice? What do I do next? Because that will save us. <clears throat> Number four, Peter is also impressed by the facts of spiritual experience. All right. And uh, we've already gone through what, his, what he stands up and actually says. And then uh, James, uh, he, he replies and He's, he's great. He's not replying to Peter uh, or, or, or uh, Paul and Barnabas. He's actually replying to uh, the legalist in that place. All right. And he says there, the Gentiles were not obliged to keep the law. All right. The Jewish law. He says Peter's defense or Peter's point was conclusive. God made it really, really clear that he's accepted law-free Gentiles. Okay, and then he quotes, as I said, from, from, from Amos, but Hosea chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 12, and Isaiah chapter 45. Remember he says, the prophets, plural. 
All right? And it's very fascinating when you read that, it says even the people from Edom, the people from Edom actually hated the Jews. They hated Israel. And, 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 and the, the, that scripture tells us that the Edomites, all right, will turn to the Lord. Very fascinating. And so, you know, just three things really quickly as I, as I come to an end is, is that we are all saved by grace and grace alone. All right. Keep reminding yourself of that. Number two, we are free from uh, the legislations of the Mosaic Covenant. All right. So I'm just saying to you, you know, hey, let it be for myself. I don't want to criticize anybody else. I want to just love on people. I'm not here to criticize you for what you do, what you wear, what you eat. I'm not saying anything to you. That's your choice. All right. But I don't want to be at a place where I'm kind of trying to criticize you just because I think differently. Having said that, it's really, really important that I'm not causing anybody to stumble because of what I'm doing. So there's a balance in everything. You're tracking with me? So if I want to invite somebody to my house and I know that they are vegetarians, I will have vegetarian food because I want to honor them. Am I being a hypocrite? Of course not. I'm just honoring them. And I don't want in any way to be a stumbling block. Tracking everybody? Number three, so we are saved by grace alone. We are free from the legislations of the Mosaic Covenant. Number three, we don't have to adopt anyone else's culture in addition to my faith in Jesus. All right, salvation is by grace through faith, not because of the law, all right, and not because of the culture of any religion, of any nation. <laughs> you know, you go to Africa nowadays, even, even today, you still, still see them in all the heat, all right? They're all suited and booted. All right, where did it come from? Missionaries from the West. You go to Western churches, Adha <laughs> Chadi. All right? <laughs> we have somebody at the back also. <laughs> I was just reminded of that, yeah? All right. Hey, no problem at all. Okay, we don't mind half, long, whatever, bear something and come. That's all we say. <laughs> okay. You frown on people wearing caps or tattoos or earrings or, or whatever, long hair. I think it's really important that we are at a place where You're giving people a freedom to decide what they want to. Do we talk to them about people? We can talk about it. We can understand what's it about, actually. All right. But I want to show you from there that it's so very important that the main key thing is, is speaking against sexual immorality. All right. When you read 1 Corinthians 8, you begin to understand differently. What Paul is saying again, he's talking about the fact that you and I should be really clear that we are not being a stumbling block to a person with a weaker conscience. We can talk about it at another time. All right, I want to close with just these verses from chapter 30, verse 30 onwards. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together, they delivered the letter, and when the people heard the letter read out aloud they were overjoyed and delighted by its encouraging message and john and uh, and judas and silas who themselves were prophets said much to encourage and affirm and strengthen the believers at the end of the day that's what we want for each one of us so father we thank you for instruction that comes from your word Thank you that it brings us to a point where it actually asks us the question, who do we draw wisdom from? Who, when we go through different uh, situations in our life, how can we look to people who uh, you have given us? 
that they can bring wisdom and understanding into our circumstance and situation and that thus save us from a lot of headache and heartache thank you that at the end of the day lord we see that in whatever uh disagreement there was that by your spirit you allowed for people in their differing opinions to come to a place where they agreed together sent off a letter the letter was received ecstatically with much joy and much delight being encouraged and informed and strengthened and that at the end of the day the church grew and that's what we want to be our hearts to be lord that wherever we are and god we pray that uh, uh, we would be uh, like radical progressive antioch that that would be our portion and that you would grace us greatly to embrace change uh, as we go along and uh, lord as we deliberate lord and even as our team spends time together on friday and saturday this coming week god we pray this morning that you would grant us your spirit without measure lord and that we would just be able to see one another being built up as with the church to the glory and the praise and the honor of your name amen, amen and amen. amen amen god bless you people yeah thank you